Command Query Separation, or CQS for short, was first mentioned as an ID specific to object-oriented programming. But since, in the beginning, the first few years of my career, I mainly worked with languages that are not rigid object-oriented programming, it took me quite a few years to come across this principle. And even now, if you search for command query separation, then you'll come across hundreds of examples for Java and C Sharp, but very little in a language like Python or JavaScript. Why is that? Does this principle not apply to other paradigms? Let's look at how CQS is actually not specific to object-oriented programming. Part 1. What is CQS? CQS as a principle says to separate queries from commands. We'll look at what that means with code examples. CQS also has a bigger brother called CQRS, which is CQS but then applied to the architectural level. This video will not be about CQRS, it will only be about CQS. I will not show architecture diagrams, I will show code to get into the details. CQS is a principle you apply to functions or methods. It says to separate queries from commands. Queries are functions that read and commands are functions that write. The principle says you should have only two types of methods, two types of functions in your app, in your code base. You're either a query or you are a command, but you're not both. You're either reading or writing, but not both. Queries are defined as returning a result and they do not change the state of the system. Now, technically, this says observable state, because there could be internal state, like maybe a cache, that you do want to change when a query is being ran, but that's not observable state. That's not state visible to the outsider, to the call side. If you do not understand this, that's okay, just forget the word observable. Queries are asking a question, and the act of asking a question should not change the answer. The answer should always be predictable. And commands are changing the state of a system, but they do not return a value. Instead of asking a question, they are performing an action. In other words, queries do not mutate the state of your app, commands do mutate the state of your app. Let's look at an example. First we'll look at an object-oriented programming example. We'll use a class which is combining the state and behavior. Behavior being functions, you're, be you're combining that in one thing. After this, we'll look at a functional programming example where we don't, where we're not combining those two concepts, we're separating them out. That's the, the big difference between object-oriented programming and functional programming. In here, you can see I have one query function, one query method, and I have two command methods. There's a balance that if you construct this account class, then you end up with a balance and you can retrieve this balance. The query function returns data, but it does not change the state and the command functions are updating the state. The balance is being updated if some stuff. Now you can see that the query is returning something, it has a return statement, and the commands are not returning anything. There's no return statements in these two functions. If you look at how this is used, you could create an account, you could retrieve its balance, which is a query. Uh, you can read this by seeing the get keyword. Not all functions that have the word get in the name are a query according to the CQS principle, but it's a good indicator that it could be one. In this case, I used it. The get balance is a query, and then you can deposit, you can withdraw, and those are commands. Only those commands will change the inner state of the account, and that means that after you get the balance again, you'll get a different state back. But calling the get balance itself can never change the state. That's it, that's the principle. Let's look at a functional programming example next. I've got basically the same functionality, I just don't have a class around it right now. The functions are here, get balance, deposit, withdraw. The state of the balance is being passed in as an argument for all of these functions as the first argument. And the call side is responsible for keeping the state and then giving the state to the function calls. So the same queries that are here, the balance uh, so right now this is quite a silly example of course because this is just returning the same value i'll get to this in a moment um, but the deposit and the withdraw take the balance as its input and they can then mutate the state but for this to work in functional programming where there is no mutation you cannot modify a variable you have to return a new version so functional programming mutating a state means you're returning a new state that means that a command in functional programming, in the CQS principle, does return a value. It's just the new state. There's still no mutation going on, and your command is still something that is not 
used to query for some data. No, you are actively mutating something, even though you're storing it yourself and it's not happening internally in a class. So the principle still applies. Queries return data and commands do things. They update the state. Part two, why CQS? There's a few reasons of why CQS is considered the best practice, why it became a principle that is very well known. But all of those reasons come back to the core of the matter, where separating out, isolating your mutations is the best practice that gives us all the advantages. For starters, it yields simpler code. It's a sort of separation of concerns. You're extracting those two things out. You're ending up with two functions that are smaller, simpler, and more focused, instead of having one bigger, more complex function that does multiple things. And this will make you faster. You can quickly get an intuitive sense of what a function does by taking a look at it. Because if it starts with the word get, then you can start assuming if you use the CQS principle throughout your code base, you can start assuming this is a query. I can assume there's no mutation going on here. I can safely call this multiple times, cache the result, do whatever I want with it, and it will not meddle with the internal state of things. And it also gives you easier testing. The fact that you have simpler functions that just do one thing also gives you tests that are more focused, simpler, and just test one thing. Now that you know that your queries aren't going to mutate state, that means more tests of queries, but also probably of commands, can be moved to the unit level. And you don't have to have them at the more expensive and slower integration or end-to-end -end level. And lastly, it gives you more clear API design. Whether it's an internal API that is internal to your code base or internal to your team or company, or an external API, it doesn't matter. If you apply CQS as a, a principle for your API design, you could choose a naming convention that makes it clear what is a query and what is a command. Or you could even literally mention in your API docs, we are using CQS, this is a list of queries, this is a list of commands. Part three, exceptions. Anywhere where you have asynchronicity or multi-threadedness at play, you may have a reason to break the pattern. Let's look at an example. Imagine you have a stack. In JavaScript, you would usually do this with an array, but let's imagine you implemented it yourself with a class. In one thread, somewhere in your code, there is, on some event, you are getting the last item from the stack, and you are doing something with it, and once you're done with it, you're removing it from the stack. Or maybe not once you're done, but immediately. Doesn't matter. And somewhere else in your code, because this is an asynchronous problem, you may have the same thing. You may have a race condition. These two, you don't know which one will fire first, whether they will run at the same time. Okay, JavaScript doesn't actually work this way. It's single threaded, so this is guaranteed to be successful, to have no bugs. But imagine you are in a situation where you have a multi-threaded code base or you don't have single threaded language. What could happen is that this happens first, then this happens, then this last thing is being removed, which is actually the thing that this code pulled off the stack. And then this code is removing the wrong thing. Now this problem is why the pop method was invented. If you use, instead of your own stack, you use a simple array and you would use the pop method, then you would have one method that breaks CQS that would be both getting the item from the stack and updating the stack so that the item is removed from the stack at the same time in one method. The return value is the only way in which you could have that value. After this method has run, the item is also removed from the stack. Now this convenience method is not always necessary, but it is nice to have. This example is probably not the best one because I tried to find a really, really small example. But imagine you have somewhere else in your code, you have this stack object that is maybe not a stack, but it is general state that you have. And then from multiple events on, you're going to mutate that state. If you have global mutable state, as it's called, then you're going to have race conditions. And a pop method is a simple way to prevent that kind of thing. Now, this is a very small example, but you have this in the very large as well. If you look at RabbitMQ, for example, it has a pop method. RabbitMQ is a service, a microservice, a piece of software you can install to send things to with multiple servers. You could use that as a queue, but it still has a pop method, which is the operation of retrieving something and deleting it from the queue in one go, because otherwise you have race conditions as a possibility. Let's look at one more example of where you might want to deviate from using the CQS pattern. If you're working with 
events or with callbacks with promises or async await code then you might have a command so that is an operation a mutation of which you might need to know whether it was successful maybe you it could fail maybe there's something else going on maybe you need some kind of result let's look at this example i've got a user manager here that has an add user uh, command this asynchronously adds a user and then it returns the user id it has a very similar situation as the pop function because this user id you have this one chance of getting the user id of the last added user if this is a situation that you need the thing you just added you might want to know the id of this is a reasonable use case a command in principle is not returning anything if you look at the very strict oo definition of a cqs command but here it is returning a user id because it makes sense in another situation this could also throw an error because this is an async await function so this technically in javascript is a promise promises can reject what if this fails this could throw and the call side would have to try and catch that exception the rule says don't return from a command but in practice it makes sense right now so you either end up with a command that also returns a value or you have to refactor this and you have to somehow introduce a method that says um, async uh, gets ID of last added user. But this may be very difficult or impossible to implement depending on how this database service is implemented. If you are sending lots of requests to this service, then how would it know which was the last one? And that's it. I hope this was helpful. I hope you liked it. What do you think? Is this a pattern that you could start applying right now? Please leave a comment and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.